Okay, so we've shown how one key cryptography is good, two are better, three are better still, but you can still get some really useful cryptography out of no keys at all. But how does this actually improve everyday life? What can we do with these UDF functions to make life easier for everyday people without using the mesh at all? Hello, I'm Phil Pan Baker, and in this presentation, I'm going to be showing you an app how we can apply UDFs and how that can make it really easy to pay your bills and do your taxes. Two things that are probably the most irritating in the modern world. Okay, so one of the questions that usually comes up with UDFs is why aren't these URIs? And the answer is a UDF is not a URI, it is a component that we can put into a URI. So for example, let us say we have our MDF, uh, our UDF from last time. So uh, MB5S-R4AJ3B, all that stuff. Okay, as much precision as we need. And that is the fingerprint of a document. So we can create a URI for that document by just sticking UDF in front of it. URI scheme, URI data. And what we're saying here is that this is a reference, an authentic, self-authenticating reference to this document. It doesn't tell you how to locate that information. But if you have located that information, it allows you to check with a certain work factor that you've got the particular data that you wanted. And obviously, to get the sufficient work factor, you're going to have the sufficient precision in your UDF. But this is one way that we can turn a UDF into a URI. Okay, so what else can we do? Well, that gives us a way of, loc of checking the information after somebody's given it as it. That's very useful for things like a XML schema or whatever. But what if we want to also tell the user how to locate it? And um, about 10 years ago now, I guess, uh, Stephen Farrell and I and some other folk were working on a scheme called Ni, N-I, that did something like that. And basically it was a fingerprint plus a DNS name. Okay, so what we have here is a locator, you know, it tells us a web service, it's given us a DNS name and a uh, scheme type. That's enough information to do an SRV or a TXT prefix lookup in the DNS to obtain a web service. And that web service can be something that we throw this content digest at and see if something comes back and then if something comes back we can check that it is what was originally referenced by calculating the fingerprint of it and seeing if the two match okay so there are there's one little detail here and that is that we don't actually throw the content digest itself at the service the principle of least privilege tells us we do better if we take the content digest of the content digest, the fingerprint of the fingerprint, and present that to the service. And that way we can present the um, service with the fingerprint without revealing quite as much information over the wire. 
Okay. The, but what if we've not set up a web service discovery thing and we've not filled in those SRV or TXT DNS records? Well, it falls back to a well-known service, which is, you know, what well-known is there for. So the interpretation of this piece by default goes to HTTP S, have as much security as we can, example.com slash and then the content digest, oh sorry, and then dot well known slash some identifier yet to be registered, I think it should be UDF. And then the content digest of this, so MB, well, MC, four, five, whatever. And what we do is that we express the content digest to exactly twice the precision we were originally given it in. And I explain the reason for that in the specifications. Okay, so now we've got a way of expressing a self-authenticating name. Actually, strictly speaking, this isn't a pure name because it's indexical, so it's type 2, not type 1. Uh, but it's a self-authenticating self identifier. And that's something that's really useful. So we can put that on a document like a... Uh, a tax statement, so you know, a W two or you know the UK equivalent or whatever. Um, we can put it on an invoice, so your gas bill, your electricity bill, or whatever, can come with a barcode, which is the U, which is the QR code encoding of this URI, and that can take you to an electronic version of the document, and then when you download it you know that you've received exactly the document that was uh, that you should be sent, which is really powerful. However, um, we can do better. If you're going to be putting, uh, if you're going to be scanning documents and going from a QR code to an electronic copy of that document, well, where does that electronic copy sit? It sits in the cloud. I don't like my data sitting in the cloud unencrypted. So we want to be able to encrypt. So in order to turn this into an encryption scheme, what we do is that instead of putting a content digest here, we put an encryption key, or rather a master key that is fed into a KDF function that is used to provide the master key to decrypt our document. And this is the reason that we have this content digest of the fingerprint approach, you know, the fingerprint of the fingerprint, because doing it always means that we don't have to distinguish between encrypted and content digest. It saves us a code path, which saves us an opportunity to slip up and make an error. So an encrypted uh, uh, UDF, uh, URI, can be really, really powerful. So imagine you're doing your taxes, you scan that document, and the electronic version comes back. Whoopee! Now, all that stuff that's sitting out in the cloud can be encrypted. And because it's encrypted and because it can only be decrypted by the very person who has the paper document, it means that we don't need to muck around with the usual authentication or establishing an account or all the usual stuff that we have to do with... Um, downloading electronic copies. What we've got here is a more flexible way of binding 
an electronic paper fl f document flow, an electronic task flow, to a legacy paper task flow. And one of the reasons why it is so hard to convert bureaucratic processes from paper to digital is precisely because you have to keep, th because the legacy process has a physical document and that physical document is the item that causes the work to be transferred from one person to another. And if you get rid of the physical t token, it becomes really tricky because the, the legacy process has to stop and be replaced by the digital one all in one go. With this QR code, this encrypted QR code approach, we can weave the two together and you can move from digital to paper or paper to digital, go back and forth at any stage multiple times and so instead of having to have a big bang dematerialize and digital workflow, you can do it gradually, incrementally. You've got lower costs and you've got a lower risk of failure and you can test everything as you're going along. So no waterfall models. And so it's a powerful technique in its own right. OK, so I've shown you one of the ways in which we can make use of a, UR, a fingerprint inside a, uh, another internet identifier, in that case, a URI. There's another way we can use them, however, and that is inside a domain name. And this is used to create what I call a strong internet name. This, is, this approach is based on work that Butler Lamson, um, Bran Lamakia and others did at Microsoft uh, that's the core of .NET security. And in .NET security, modules link to each other via strong names, which are signatures over the contents of the uh, DLL or the library or the object or whatever. We can apply the same thing to internet names. And what we do is we insert a fingerprint into a name. So let's get a clean board to address that. So what is a strong internet name? OK, so imagine Alice's regular email address is alice at example. Dot com. To turn that into a strong internet name, we need to be able to inject our fingerprint of some security policy or whatever into the name itself. So the idea is to establish a closure over the parts of the identifier that tell us how to communicate and the security policy which governs the interpretation of that address. And so for the time being, let's imagine that our security policy is a PGP key, you know, a PGP encryption key or an SMIME encryption key, you know, something that has an implicit security policy, use me to communicate. Now, we can, of course, go much further and develop a security policy language and do that stuff that Matt Blaze did with Policymaker and take fingerprints of those policies and inject them. But that's not where the mesh is right now. I'm just presenting the technology. OK, so we're going to take our digest. And so say the digest is MB. 5s dash r for a j dash and so on. You know, you're going to want to have at least um, 20, 24 characters or whatever for this type of thing because you want a you know, 100 bit, 120 bit uh, work factor. So we take our security policy, that, the fingerprint of our security policy, to turn it into a DNS label. 
we apply the same approach that was um, applied uh, for internationalized domain names. And uh, I think it was Paul Hoffman told me to do this, that this is the way that it should be done. Not that he necessarily thinks this is a good idea. Uh, ICANN might not, for reasons I'll come to in a moment. So we've now got a way of, we've now got a fingerprint that is almost and certainly never going to accidentally collide with a legitimate uh, domain name label, well, a non-fingerprint label. And we've added a prefix on it anyway, just to make sure. And we can now put that, inject that label into the DNS label at two points. We can put it in here, or we can put it in here, you know, the start and the end. Now, what are the advantages of doing it in the two places? Well, if we put it at this end, we can then set up a DNS server so that when somebody sends mail to alice at mm-mb5s whatever dot example dot com, that the mail is delivered to the correct mail server. You know, we can provide for backwards compatibility. So we've got an email address here that we can give out to everybody that will work for everybody. But people who know how to interpret the strong internet name piece are able to do something a little bit more and get enforce the security policy on it, which provides us with a uh, promiscuous security type approach, a best effort encryption approach. And some of you are probably saying, well, what if I'm sending client data? What if I'm sending uh, patient data and I have to be absolutely sure that it goes encrypted or not at all? Well, in that case, putting the strong name as the first component in the list is saying, well, this is something that will never appear in an ICANN global TLD. You know, we can make that n not happen by fiat. Uh, so this is a name that cannot ever occur in the wild. And what it is saying is the root of trust for this name is this security policy. And you can only interpret this name if you have that security policy. And you can only do it correctly if you follow it. So that's a pretty uh, powerful mechanism. We can establish email addresses that are backwards compatible and also names that are deliberately not backwards compatible. And the secure interpretation of the name is bound to the name itself. And what we use this for in the mesh is to provide a, an internal representation of a trust binding we have already obtained. So this is used extensively for trust after the first use. So the first use of example.com might be untrusted. It might be secured via a trusted third party. You know, we might have an extended validation certificate in there. You know, there might be a strong security binding. Or it might be, uh, or we could do any other scheme. But once we have obtained that that uh, trust context and the security policy, and we know how to trust it, we can pickle that out. We can make that a fixed point by turning it into a strong name. And so all the time with the uh, mesh, we're wanting to, you know, we use trusted third parties for as trusted introducers, but we don't, uh, once we've performed the introduction, we don't then uh, accept that original trust provider automatically to tell us about the updates. The original trust provider can tell us, no, that was a bad idea. Uh, I've revoked that certificate. That's fine. But they can't tell us, oh, Alice has changed the key from X to Y. Because that means that instead of trusting Alice, 
we're now trusting the trusted third party. So strong internet names are the mechanism that we use in the mesh to cut the Gordian knot of managing trust. And it is a more powerful technique than PKIX or Dane. So in the web PKI, we have 50 trust providers, which are the certification certificate authorities behind the 100 or so key root keys that are expressed in the web browser trust stores. And it is just 50. It's not a thousand like some history, some hysterical folk are saying it is 50. Um, the thousand came from folk who didn't understand P kicks. And some people said, well, 50 is still too many. Well, possibly. Dane reduces those 50 to one, the ICANN root. And if 50 is too many, well, one is far too few. With strong internet names, we reduce these to zero. Once we've established the trust, the system has tr the name is trusted in of, of itself, which is a more powerful way of going about it. And much more suited to cases where we want to establish a framework of trust and then go offline. So you have the robot and it has its leg shot off. And so it puts on a new leg. And so it wants to trust the leg. So maybe a trusted third party is used to trust the leg. And then it runs off into the desert to do more roboting things. It doesn't want to constantly be getting OCSP tokens or getting the latest SSL certificate to talk to its leg. No, we want to be able to pickle out those trust relationships and make them permanent. And strong internet names are the way to do it. OK, so at this point, I've des described two of the three technical building blocks used as the foundation for the mesh. In the next two podcasts, I'm going to be showing you the cryptographic message format for securing mesh data. And that gets us into blockchain and more in JSON. So please join me for that. And please click like and please hit subscribe. Thank you very much. Thank you.